All right. So good morning. Picking back up today. Uh, of course, we finished up last week talking about the Anabaptists and talking about the theological break there. Today, we're going to go down sort of an entirely different path and almost a different form of Reformation. And so uh, today we're going to flip back up. Let me just go ahead and advance the chart here. You remember the, um, the chart that we've been using sort of as our guide is this um, simplified version of uh, the various um, representations of denominational and theological. And um, that's a nice feedback. Um, that was me. Okay. Me, sorry. That's okay. We won't hold you accountable for it. I also, <laughs> also just lost all of my, this is weird. Just lost all of my video screen component there, which is sort of strange, but okay. Um, I can manage without it. The, um, oh, I don't know why, because I accidentally managed apparently to turn off my video, so it's not going to want to show your videos. I mean, that's fair enough. Uh, so today, the, the bit that we're going to take, remember just giving quick form of review last, from the last couple of weeks. We've been using this as our sort of chart to, to define things and to move through things. Again, it's overly simplified, but probably has about the right level of detail for what we're doing here. And then we, we expressed it this way, which is another way of breaking things out. Sort of these initial branches of the Reformation, Lutherans, Calvinists, and then Anglicans, uh, the things that did not break away, uh, the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church, and these sort of later branches or offshoots of which the first one that we came to were the Anabaptists. And again, the way I'm sort of looking at this is sort of going chronologically, although we will break out of that and start grouping by concept. And so the first break that we came to last week, if you remember, was in 1525. And that's the breaking away of the Anabaptists over the issue of baptism, primarily in Switzerland, but then it spreads to other areas. So this red area that we covered here is the area we covered last last week, talking about what that was and how that uh, transformed into the Mennonites, the Hutterites, and the Amish, all under the broad category of being Anabaptists. So we were down on the bottom half of the chart, which is where most of the primary part of the of the Reformation takes place. If you remember, we sort of divided before about this idea of the bottom half of this chart is sort of more traditionally what we would call reformed. And the top half is a derivative off of what had been the Catholic Church, although we'll talk about how those two things influence each other. So that's where we were last week. Today, we're going to jump from the bottom of the chart up to the top of the chart. And we're doing that because of the chronology here. So we're going to jump from 1525 as the breaking off point before to 1534, and we see that that's the break off of the Anglican Church, which is also the Episcopal Church. So if I say Anglican Church, what are we talking about? Church of England. The Church in England. My daughter is very much defined by a term known as an Anglophile. She likes things even argue that she loves things English. That, so that's where that comes from, the Angla, of, Angli, of, of the Angles, um, who were part of the folks that settled in, in on the island that we know as England, Britain, the United Kingdom. That's a whole other thing. A whole other discussion is which of those is right at various points in time. But the Anglican church is the English church. And we see that 1534 is the date that we have a break. And remember our concept here is if there's a break, understanding what happened in that break, because that can inform and help us understand what the differences were. And normally those are going to be some form of theological difference to some degree. So that's why we're sort of studying the breaks and then carrying out uh, the expression of that. So where we're going to be today is along the, the Anglican axis here, uh, the, the Church of England. Would be another can way to describe can it. I go backwards for just a second? Because there's a lot of room between 1054 when the kind of Western Eastern split to the 1517 for pretty much those 400 plus 
years, almost 500 years, were things pretty stable in the church? Uh, if you remember some of the things that we covered, the answer to that is both yes and no. Uh, theologically, for the most part, things were somewhat unified. It's during that period of time that the papal schism happens and all of that other stuff. So even though it's one church, there is a lot of there's a lot of stuff lot of going debate. a lot of stuff going on. But not like any big divisions. Not, not anything approaching the fifteen seventeen. I mean, I remember you talking about there were kind of people reforming prior to Luther, but the big splits aren't covered on the chart. So I'm assuming for the most part things kind of trucked along the way they were trucking along. Correct. For the most part, the answer to that is yes. There are two exceptions to that that we talked about. One of them, he came up last week, we were talking about the, uh, the Anabaptist break and then where they end up going. Remember, they end up going for a period of time when they're forced out of Switzerland, they go over to Bohemia. Yeah. And the reason they go over to Bohemia is that's where John Huss, about a century before Luther, had some of the early ideas of a, of a reformation. And then the other one, which is actually relevant today, and I promise you I did not pay Kathy to say that, is the other one we're going to talk about briefly is John Wycliffe, who was an English reformer. And so that also was about the same time as Huss. Uh, remember, Wycliffe's followed followers were called the Lollards. If you remember that part we talked about, we didn't spend a lot of time talking about it. But short answer is during most of the period from 1054 to 1517, there's not a lot of theological split inside the church. There is all kinds of stuff happening on these. During that period of time, you end up with three popes at the same time. So obviously there's stuff going on, but not theologically. So that's a good question, just to putting in the proper context. So my question for today, again, is 1534, the break between the Catholic Church and the English, Anglican Church, what issue lies at the point of this division? Henry Who is the head of the church? Who is the head of the church? And Kathy's right, Henry wants a divorce or an annulment. Both of those things are true answers. So the real point that lies at the division here, simply expressed as this guy. As we, this is probably one of the most famous representations or as Alexis and I covered one of our podcast episodes a while back. He probably, he, he's the poster child for every Renaissance fair everywhere in the world because it's normally set during that, that age or into the Elizabethan age, which follows after him. So the point of division, more than anything else, as we normally think about it, is a person. And that person is Henry. But I want to guard against a couple of things here that are well done. And I'll post some of the links to some of these uh, particularly the Ryan Reeves videos from Gordon, Co Gordon Cornwell uh, Seminary are very good about this. We tend to want with the English Reformation, which is what we're talking about here, we have a great tendency in some ways to oversimplify it. And that's a dangerous thing to do, even when the oversimplification is correct. And so, for example, one of the things that you will primarily hear about the English Reformation, for example, as opposed to Luther or Calvin, or some of the other elements of Reformation, is that it's more political than theological. And that is both a true statement and also simplifying it too much at the same time. So just recognizing that becomes important, is that if you think of the English Reformation as being only driven by political and personality events, you're missing something. If you don't recognize the importance of the politics and the personality events, you're missing something. So it's understanding that it's a little bit of a different animal. It also is, uh, I guess I heard one person describe this as the difference between an explosion and a slow boil. Luther's Reformation, when we see it historically, seems to just burst on the scene and then go really, really, really fast. And the English Reformation doesn't have that same type of, there's no, there are events, we're going to talk about several of them today, but there's no tacking of the 95 Theses event really in the English Reformation, and it tends to take a much longer period of time. So it has a different character and a different flavor. Does that make sense? And as a result of that, it's going to be a different thing. 
So uh, we'll the question regarding who's the head of the church, that question had come up before. I mean, that's kind of. It had come up in a slightly different way, if you remember back to the investment um, controversy. Yeah, who has, the, who right? has the right to invest or choose who those people are? So that had already happened. And we're going to see that the 1534 has its roots and stuff before 1534. Okay. Uh, but the, the pivotal event that causes the break here is represented by, by the man on the screen. It is represented by Henry. So any questions just about that quick introduction before we, we move forward here fairly quick? All right. So the first thing we have to do, and there will be a test on this later, is you have to understand and be able to describe the evolution of the House of Plantagenet. <laughs> which is a piece of cake, obviously, is represented here by this very simple stick diagram of heredity. So we're going to spend a little bit of time in English history. It's a shame Alexis isn't here because she would be a great resource for this. But we're going to try not to spend too much, but it is crucial to... Sure, un it's a good resource. Yeah, sure, yes, too. That's right. Those of you that have actually been to, to England are also all good resources. It is important to understand the context that we've arrived at in 1534. This is important and has a political context. So the House of Plantagenet is one way of describing the Royal House of England, but it doesn't stay that way. For example, the current monarchs in England are the House of what? Elizabeth II is the House of Windsor. Windsor. They ultimately can trace back to the House of Plantagenet through some various ways, but we don't even hear much about the Plantagenets as much as we hear about because of the event that we're about to talk about here now, which is, here we go, that house is gonna become divided. And so we have the House of Plantagenet, Henry Plantagenet being the head of that house, and it breaks into two parts, two divisions of the House of Plantagenet, the Lancaster side and the York side. So these are two branches, two divisions inside of the House of Plantagenet. And I've chosen the colors here for a particular reason. We'll see that as I move through. If you want to think Lancaster red and York white, there's a reason for that. Okay, wait a minute. Where does the House of Plantagenet come from? Uh, are we getting there? We won't go all the way back, but it is... It goes back to Edward III, who becomes the monarch in um, 1328. I think that's like the other date of his, of his monarchy. Is that correct? The answer is yes. And um, he, he descends from indirectly from the Norman kings, then some of the other things that lead down through Henry II and down to further things to there. The period before 1328, the period from the late... Uh, 1066, which was when the Normans come and conquer England. So these Fr people that have French noble connections become the kings of England. That's the connection between England and France that happens so often. Uh, there's a series of different families and dynasties that rise to power there. Eventually the Plantagenets come out of that after Henry II and then his sons. Remember we talked about King John of Magna Carta fame and then how things go south after that, particularly because of King John and then Richard and the others that come back. We eventually land on Edward's family, and then there's a break uh, over time in terms of who should, which side of his house, which are ultimately broken by the Lancaster side and the York side as to who is going to take power. And so what happens is the Plantagenets break into their two halves. They all share a common ancestor. That's why they're all Plantagenets but the, the Lancaster side of the house and the York side of the house ultimately come to, particularly for a 30 year period from 1455 to 1485, they engage in what is commonly known as the Wars of the Roses. If you have read any of Shakespeare's historical plays, uh, some of them cover this period. So plays like Richard III, uh, some of the other Henry plays, but even the ones that don't cover this period are setting up the backstory between what gets to this period. So much of a lot of folks exposure to this period of time known as the Wars of the Roses come from Shakespeare in, in culture. And then in the last 
15 to 20, 30 years through a series of novels, typically uh, 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 Philippa Gregory, and some of those that have been adapted into various uh, TV miniseries, uh, things like, if, you, if you're familiar with uh, the, the White Princess, the White Queen, the Spanish Princess, this is all also flowing out of, of those periods of time, particularly the White Princess and the White Queen are talking about this period of time when there's conflict between the two sides, the House of Lancaster and the House of York, York, which are all part of the House of Imagine. And why it's called the Wars of the Roses is they each came to be symbolized by a rose of a different color. The Lancasters were symbolized by the red rose and the York side were symbolized by the white rose, hence the War of the Roses. For their for their crests and for their seals. Did it pretty much split between like a brother brother kind of a thing? Yeah, I'll, 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 Kathy's a little bit ahead of me here, which is fine. I've got a simplified version of that big <laughs> chart that we're going to get to here in a minute, and I, I I will explain why all of this is relevant to the theology because it sets the backstory for where we're going to land here. And this is a very tumultuous period of time. It literally goes back and forth between. You know, cousins and brothers and distant cousins and who's got the right claim to the throne. It goes back and forth. Uh, the people of England never know who to be aligned with because one year it's this, the next year it's that. I mean, it's a very tumultuous time in English history. But it does finally come to an end after the most intense part of it, which is 1455 to 1485, when there's a unification of the two houses back together. And this produces what we know as the House of Tudor. And so here, you'll notice that it's reuniting the Lancaster and the York sides. I intentionally chose this color scheme. It's mostly Lancaster with a little bit of York mixed into it. And notice that they create this new thing called the Tudor Rose, which is a blend of a red rose and a white rose to symbolize that things have been united back. So without chasing a whole bunch of extra history there, does anybody have any just sort of big questions about this general flow? One big house is essentially a civil war that happens among the noble family, which breaks into two parts. And then after a period of time and a lot of conflict, it gets back together. Does it all stay on the island of England or? They have various elements of the house are getting support from continental powers like France who want to intervene. Yeah, this is where it gets really complicated. Uh, the whole complication of English and French history, just how those two things intermingle for about a forever period of time. Yeah, it makes that a little bit complicated. So it is mostly contained to England, but it's not exclusively <laughs> contained to England. And when we talk about England, we also end up talking about Scotland. We start talking about Wales. Not so much Ireland, but definitely Scotland. And that's going to play in, in a big way, the relationship between England and Scotland as we move forward theologically. So I'm pretty familiar with the Lancaster York thing, but I don't remember how Henry VII is Lancaster. I know how Elizabeth is York, but I don't know how the seventh is Lancaster. I don't remember. Maybe this will help. This is the simplified version of that family tree that we saw there. Um, Elizabeth, who Henry VII marries, and we're going to be talking a lot here about Henry VII before we get to Henry VIII, she definitely descends from the York side. And in fact, she marries Henry to seal this breach between the two sides of the houses. This is part of the settlement there. She wasn't nuts about this marriage, certainly to begin with. Henry is... Lancaster only in the sense that he breaks off from a subset of the Lancaster line where one of the, uh, Catherine of Valois, married a Tudor and Henry thus descends down. Basically most of the Lancasters that are the primary part of the line, the problem that they've gotten to by this point in the War of the Roses, most of them have died. Yeah. Primarily because of the War of the Roses. And so there's not as many Lancasters left as there are Yorks that are left. And so there's sort of this subset of the Lancaster line that comes down through the Tudors. That's why his name is Henry Tudor. He's a subset or a break off of the Lancaster line, but he's enough Lancaster that the Lancastrians can get behind him. So like the name 
Lancaster comes from, I see they're the duke of a particular area. <coughs> right. They're the duke of a particular area, <coughs> but they're all brothers. All those people on the first line, yeah. Edward, Lionel, John. <laughs> there were, Edmund, Ed, there were, Ed, there were Edward, Edward's sons who then went, the conflict arose from Edmund's descendants, the York side, I guess. Most of the period of time here, Lancasters are holding the throne, but it's not consistent. And I am, not, although I have a high level understanding of this and I get more and more of an understanding of this, I'm not going to pretend that I can navigate through the complexities, which is sort of why I included this in jest. There's a lot of complexities going on here in this family tree. And this family tree, you'll notice, uh, connects back to itself at multiple points. That's also you know, the good news and the bad news, but also makes some of the complication there. Who has a claim to the throne? Sometimes the people that have a claim to the throne can make a claim sort of through th two different lineages going back to where they parted, split, and then in some cases reunited. But why this is important to the thing that we're talking about is we do get to the end of this with Henry VII, Primarily, he's a tutor, but that ties the Lancaster side. The Wars of the Roses come to an end. He marries a princess of York descent. And so now things are unified back. And so this is what we find as we arrive in 1485, which is the end of the War of the Roses. And now we have the House of Tudor, again, derived out of the House of Lancaster, but going back to the House of Plantagenet. We have the two of them married in 1486, Henry and, and Elizabeth of York, Elizabeth of York, notice there, married. And so he is now the first Tudor king of England. And we refer to this period that runs here for about, yeah, more or less about a century and a quarter before things go off the rails a little bit with the Glorious Revolution and Oliver Cromwell and some other things. We were referred to this period of time as Tudor slash Stuart England. It's Tudors and then it's Stuarts. So have I made managed to make that as confusing as mud so far? All right. What's also important, which is why I wanted to talk about this, is how strong is the Tudor claim to the throne? Based on it's what you said, strong. it's a little bit rocky because of the, the, it was taken from the Lancasters kind of stuff. The only reason that Henry VII, for the most part, is sitting on the throne is at the Battle of Bosworth Field, Richard III is defeated, the famous from Shakespeare's play, My Horse, A Horse, A Horse, My Kingdom for a Horse, because at that point he sort of said, I don't care if I keep my, my crown, I just want to get out of here. And we know eventually that, that Richard dies. In fact, we found his bones here a couple of years ago, supposedly. Um, is the Tudor claim to the throne is sort of, first of all, it do doesn't go way back. It's arguably fairly weak because it's not even down that primary line that you would normally see in most, uh, most uh, genealog genealogical representations of a monarch. So Henry is on the throne somewhat by force, now by marriage. England is happy to sort of have this civil war over that, that he's got going for them, but the claim to the throne is a little bit weak. Does that make sense? So what's the most important thing you need as a monarch? Children. You need heirs, right? And so one of the important things that needs to happen between Henry and Elizabeth is they need to produce heirs, and the good news is they do. And in fact, the their oldest son is named Arthur Tudor. He's born in 1486, very early in the marriage. So early in the marriage, it's the, the breach has been sealed. Arthur has been born. They have an heir. It's a male heir. Everything seems to be going well, right? So again, we begin 1485, the end of the War of the Roses. Henry uh, assumes the throne in 1485, yes, there's a challenge in 1491 that he puts down by somebody who is still trying to raise the Yorkist claim to the throne, but he's able to put that down. But then something not so great happens. Uh, we get introduced to this princess from Spain. Her name is Catherine. 
And at this point, one of the things that England is looking to do is unify with a powerful continental ally. And a powerful continental ally at this point is Spain. This is the period of time when uh, 1492, uh, Cat, uh, uh, Isabel and Ferdinand have combined two of the, what had been rival kingdoms in Spain together. So they're now a greater Spain. They finished pushing the Moorish influence, the Islamic influence out of Spain. They commissioned Columbus to go sailing across the ocean. Uh, Spain is definitely on the rise and will continue to be on the rise because of the riches that start flowing from the new world because of that explanation. And so England is looking to align with Spain. There's a younger Spanish princess named Catherine who is then engaged and ultimately marries Arthur, who is going to be the next king of England. So while there may or may not have been a mystical King Arthur back in English history, that's a whole other thing. There would be a King Arthur, except there's one problem. In 1502, Arthur dies. It's a couple of months, not more than half a year into his marriage to Catherine. They're both fairly young. They're, they're younger teenagers here. And so Henry's throne would have passed to his oldest son, Arthur, but now Arthur is dead. And so who's in line to take the throne? There were girls. The chart doesn't have girls, yep. but girls are yeah, and, just good for marrying at this point, not good for being. And, and one of the girls is going to be very important, which is Henry's sister, Margaret. We're going to, we see her down here and we'll come to that here in a minute, is that because of Arthur's death, Henry now, who is the second son, is now going to be in line to the throne. And Henry, because he was not going to be king, a lot of his training, we talked about this before, was already geared to him as possibly holding a high position in the church. So he's been raised expecting probably to be a bishop or most likely a cardinal given his birth. And so that's been his training. But suddenly with Arthur's untimely death, after his marriage to Catherine, really important, after his marriage to Catherine, Suddenly, Henry finds himself he dies now the in battle, there. though. So, what battle's going on, right? Doesn't he die in battle? Some he died of what? Uh, I can't remember what he died of, but he didn't die in battle. I thought he died in battle. No. So Henry becomes oh, I, Henry, Henry becomes the next king, and he also they want to continue this marriage alliance with. <laughs> And so one of the things that happens, this is familiar history, I know to a lot of you, but it's really important here, is that they get a special dispensation from the Pope for Henry to marry the person that had been before his brother's death. What relation to him? Sister-in-law. Sister-in-law. Catherine had hmm. been his sister-in-law, although briefly had been his sister-in-law. They get a special dispensation for Henry to marry Catherine. And so she doesn't have to go back to Spain. There doesn't have to be some other, other handling here. And so Catherine becomes queen of England by being married to Henry, even though she had intended to be the queen consort of England by married to his brother, Arthur. This becomes very important. So uh, early on, there's the battle of Flodden Field. That's actually important. Go ahead. Somebody have a question? I think somebody was calling their dog or something. Okay. It says that Arthur died of a vapor which proceeded from the air and Catherine also was sick, but she recovered and he died six months, six months short of his 16th birthday. Yeah, they were both young and that's important because of how it plays back into what we're going to see after this. So Henry is now married to Cat. So she has this unique place on the chart. That's why the marriage lines extend to two brothers here. A um, uh, number of things that happen. We're going to talk more about Henry, obviously, go through. I just want to give the big sweep of things here at setting up the background and the big sweeps. Eventually, Henry's throne passes to his son, Edward. We'll talk about how that comes to be. From Edward, it will eventually pass to Lady Jane Grey. <laughs> You want to count her as Queen of England because she's only Queen of England maybe for nine days. She descends from Henry's sister uh, and other and other lines that relate to that. Um, 
um, and as as another offshoot of Henry the Seventh, we'll talk about why that is. She's only queen for nine days. Mary becomes queen. Elizabeth becomes queen, and then ultimately James becomes queen. We're going to go through this. I just want to get you. I want to get the big sweep. So as we're moving through that, you can see this. So we go from Henry to Henry because we had to skip over Arthur. From Henry to Edward. Edward, whether you want to count Lady Jane Grey as queen or not, it's nine days. She's executed. To Mary, to Elizabeth, to James. That's the big sweep of Tudor Stuart English history from the reuniting after the War of the Roses down until the early 17th century with James, the sixth of Scotland and James the first of England. Why is the second son named after the father rather than the first son? I don't know in this case why that was the case. So that's the big sweep. So now let's talk about some things, some things that are relevant here. Henry had the benefit, Henry VII had the benefit of having two sons. So that when Arthur died, there was a son to take over a place. Were women allowed to inherit the monarchy in England? Not up to this point. Correct. And they certainly were not in line, even if they were older, to be ahead of a male sibling. As Kathy mentioned earlier, mostly they were used for political marriages and alignments and not actually to rule. It's interesting, an interesting element of Tudor Stuart, Tudor, Tudor Stuart England in that there are, if you want to count Jane Grey, three queens during this period of time, as many queens as there are kings, but it was not the norm. And in fact, uh, Margaret uh, was born in 1589 to Edward and Elizabeth. She's two years older than her brother, Henry. It was never even considered that Margaret would take the throne of Henry <clears throat> because Henry, Henry's a male. You said but, women were mostly used for political alliances and what? And marriages, through marriages. Oh, okay, through marriages. But certainly. And, and having babies. Yes. Yeah, right. That was, get, marry them off so they can have some sons. Yeah. So... I realize here I've got actually got the slides. I'm going to play in a slightly different order than I want them. So let me jump over to what I want to jump to here. Uh, except to say that the assumption that is often made in the way this story is normally told is that Henry and his need for an heir is the catalyst for the English Reformation, which is true. But it, we should always remember that there had already been ideas of Reformation and there was already some element of Protestantism in England at the time of the events that will eventually lead to here in 1534 with the Act of Supremacy, which is our jumping off point. But they were not strong. England was primarily a fairly strong Catholic nation, even as Luther and Calvin and Zwingli's reforms are breaking out in the late 15 teens on the continent of England, um, continent of Europe, England is still from a practice standpoint, pretty Catholic. But there had been some elements of reform prior to this. Uh, Thomas Bilney, about the time of this, is sometimes referred to as one of the fathers of the English Reformation. He is similar in, in some ways to the way that Luther comes to evolve in terms of because he gets familiar with reading the New Testament in its original Greek versus being told what it says through the Vulgate. Uh, he sort of sees some of the same things that Luther does in terms of where he sees scripture not being in line with church practice. And he's an early, he's one of his early friends are William Tyndall. When, William Tyndall is worthy of a whole study all his own. We talked about him a little bit when we talked about the, the, the biblical study a couple of years ago. Tyndall is probably most known, you might know what Tyndall is probably most known for? Dying. Martyr's death. He died a martyr's death. There's no doubt about that. that's one of the things he know. But why did he die a martyr's death? From translating the Bible. Translating he asked the Bible. To, to translate the Bible into English. English, yeah. And he was one of the early reform-minded folks. And he's he's a contemporary of this period. We're going to see the interaction between Henry and Tyndall, which is important. The point I want to make by including this slide, not you know, I, I, I. Uh, I steal with pride slides from all over the internet so I don't have to recreate them myself, 
is that it's important to understand that there was an element of reformation in England before 1534, but it was not widespread, nor was it strong. In 1517, when Luther's tacking stuff to the door, England is very Catholic. So there's Tyndall, a study at Oxford and Cambridge. He convinced, again, he actually read the Bible and came to realize that a lot of the clergy really didn't understand what the Bible said. They were just following the church tradition. We've talked about that. And one of his famous things is he said he would produce a Bible in English that a plowboy could understand. In other words, anyone who could read, regardless of whether they had clerical training, would be able to read scripture for themselves. Go back real quick. But even at that time, not a lot of the population was literate. I mean, a plowboy wouldn't have necessarily been able to read just because it was written in his language. Correct. Although it is interesting that England, in, in some ways, in terms of literacy, was a step ahead of a lot of the rest of the continent. Okay. Uh, and also in terms of the education of their clergy, this is one of the things that came up again and again as I was doing study. A lot of the English clergy were well educated, which was a contrast to a lot of what had happened in Germany and France and the other places. I mean, that's part of the part of what caused the Lutheran uh, Reformation to be so element of the Reformation to be so powerful is that there was this the educated, the quote unquote humanist element of of um, the clergy. Those who had studied Latin and Greek and the classics were in the minority compared to much of the clergy who had risen in those positions as a result of who they knew, not what they knew or what they had studied. Uh, eventually, Tyndall is banished. He completes his New Testament. So Tyndall is a is a is a big part of the English Reformation, but he's never in England because he's been banished. And in fact, ultimately, when he dies, uh, he dies as a martyr on actually over in um, he's caught in Antwerp, I guess it is, if I remember correctly, and he's handed over to the church there, and there's where he's burnt at the stake. We'll come back to that in a minute. I just wanted to establish that. There is an element of some reformed thought that is already in England, but it is not widely held and it's not common to England. But again, the issue that gets us to 1534 is Henry perceives that he has a problem. And what's his problem? He doesn't have an heir. He doesn't have a male heir. Male heir, that's what I mean. Yeah. Right. Which is to say that he, in his mind, he doesn't have an heir. He doesn't have an heir. It's the same thing to him, although it doesn't play out that way. And so this is a later representation. There's a lot of reason to believe that part of the reason we always see sort of this fat version of Henry, if you will, is that later in life, because of health issues, uh, he gained a lot of weight. Early in life, he was pretty robust and active and you know, uh, so this, this representation of Henry, as we see him here, normally is a later life representation of him, not some of the earlier Henry that we see. But Henry does have the problem. And the problem that he's got, probably better expressed by this, by this slide, is beginning with Catherine. And Catherine, the, the children with Catherine is represented here by the red line. Beginning with Catherine in terms of legitimate children, because there also is an illegitimate son that he actually acknowledges at one point, Henry Fitzroy. Uh, but the history of Catherine and Henry trying to produce an heir is not a happy one. Uh, they have a daughter who dies. They have a series of sons who die. Eventually you get Mary in 1516, a daughter who survives. And then there's another daughter that died. There may have been other pregnancies in here a common theme with Catherine is she had a large number of miscarriages. Uh, as one of the uh, scholars I was listening to was talking about this, it's tough to diagnose from a distance. You know, looking back, there was something medically likely that was going on with her or with her and Henry that was producing this outcome. But as you can see, 15, 10, 11, 13, 14, 16, 18, uh, of at least six children, only one survives. Infant mortality was high <laughs> historically, but not this high, particularly by someone who had the benefits of being in the position of being queen 
and could rest during pregnancy and everything <clears throat> with that. So the what does the, what does the dividing red line mean? The dividing red line is these are the Henry VIII's children. The red line above the red line are, are those with Catherine. Okay. Below that are those with, you know, he went on to have six wives with other wives or, or, or others as well. So by 1518, and they've been married now for quite a while, you know, they were married pretty much in the year that he ascended the throne, which is 1509. Uh, so a decade's worth here. They've had very little success at producing an heir and they have not produced a male heir. So why is this a problem? Because the daughter can't be king. And what makes it extra? Remember, we talked about this in the setup while we went through that whole thing about the plantain. What is the Tudor hold? It's already on the throne? a little bit rocky. It's shaky. Henry is only the second Tudor king. And if you're going to build the Tudor dynasty, you got to have male heirs. And so, because of all that backstory, how the Tudors came to the throne, how Henry came to the throne, he's reminded that, you know, male heirs die. Sometimes they die in battle, but in the case of Arthur, he died from some illness. And so he's becoming more and more concerned about the status of not having an heir. Understand this is the other important part of what's here. Henry at this point, is he a Catholic or a Protestant? Catholic. Catholic. You can even argue at this point that he is a strong Catholic. Remember, he's been raised with the likelihood that he's going to be probably in the clergy before he's thrust into being the king. And in 1521, four years after Luther has tacked the theses and has written, Henry writes with the aid of a, a bishop there, writes this thing defending the Catholic sacraments. He actually writes a pamphlet <clears throat> or book which is intentionally designed to counter some of the ideas of the Lutheran Protestant Reformation. So not only is Henry not a Protestant, he's actively opposing and writing against the Protestants that were there. Because of that, the Pope actually gives a special title to Henry. Does anybody know what that title is? Defender of the Faith. Defender of the Faith. Yeah, Fide Defensor. To this day, if you look on English currency, English coinage, with images of Elizabeth II, you will sometimes see the abbreviation DF, and that stands for Defender of the Faith. It's actually one of her titles. Now, the faith they're defending there is not the Catholic faith. It's the Anglican faith, but that title is now wrapped up with the monarch of England. And so Henry is very Catholic early on there. But what's his problem? He has no male heir. Catherine is now into her 40s. She's had difficulty with conception and birth of any child, has not produced a male heir. And so history is a little divided over this, but Henry starts to believe either legitimately or otherwise, just because he wants a different outcome, that he has a scriptural problem. And what's his scriptural problem? He married his brother's wife. Right. So does scripture say anything about that? And the answer is yes. Yes. It says it in two particular places. Leviticus 18, 16 uh, specifically says you must not have sexual relations with your brother's wife. She is your brother's nakedness. This is in the middle of a whole bunch of injunctions about don't have sex with your daughter-in-law. Don't. It's, it's a lot of familial relations, but particularly calls out do not have sexual relations with your brother's wife. And the other one is in Leviticus 20, 21, where it goes a step further. It says, if a man has marital relations with his brother's wife and his indecency, he has exposed his brother's nakedness and they will be childless. So, Remember that when Henry married Catherine, what had to happen? They had to get dispensation from the Pope. Yeah. And the argument at that time was, without going way deep down this, the difference between what's called biblical law and canon law, which is church law, 
the concept that existed there was the Pope had the right to set aside church law through the tradition concept. And that what he gave there, well, the injunction against marrying your brother was, a brother's wife, there was an injunction, I'm sure, against marrying your brother, no doubt. But against marrying your brother's wife was a canonical law question. And so the Pope could make that distinction. Later, Henry comes along to believe the church, the Pope didn't have the authority because what, he's, what he violated was violating scripture. Does that make sense? But there is... Oh, there we go. However, <laughs> one of the arguments that was actually made for, it wasn't a strong argument that was made for that special dispensation, is the concept of Leverite marriage that we find in Deuteronomy, where not only is it okay to marry your to to marry or to father a child with your dead brother's wife, but it's your duty. it's your duty or your obligation. And so the Deuteronomy 25 passage was used in support back in the day, although not strongly so, it was at, argued that the Pope just had the right to give the dispensation. But then later, uh, it's believed that to some degree, Henry did come to believe because he was fairly conservative as, in most of his theological views, hence his opposition to the Reformation, was that he believed he was cursed because of Leviticus 2021. That that's the reason they had not been able to have more than one child. And that's the reason certainly that he had not been able to have a male but he wasn't childless. No. It says they will be childless. He had a child. They ha actually had several children. It was just that they didn't survive. Except one did. A girl. Yeah, they married. <coughs> Somebody John, the two scriptures seem contradictive. Yeah, yeah, I, I think the same thing too. I think the important thing, I, I was looking at some of that even this morning, Looking at the context of these scripture, for example, you see if brothers live together in the Deuteronomy thing, this is talking about the importance of carrying along a lineage in, um, um, in the case of property considerations. In fact, remember this whole concept of love, right, marriage, I didn't include the rest of the passage here, but this is where the whole sandal thing, what we see in the book of Ruth, remember is playing that out because while the husband's brother was told he should do this, he could refuse to do it and someone else could become that kinsman redeemer and carry on the bloodline. That's what well, we, that's actually what Boaz did later in the book of Ruth. It, it, it even says in six that it shall be that the firstborn whom she bears shall assume the name of the dead brother so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. So the first child of that marriage with the brother to his dead brother's wife is so that he will have an heir yeah without so it, without chasing this too far it would have almost been as if henry were providing arthur's, arthur's heir, heir, not his right, heir not his own heir right his own heir in the other difference <clears throat> the two leviticus passages would seem to indicate that the brother's not dead that's one of the other implications. I think that's very important, Donna, is it's just saying this is the, the, the Deuteronomy passage talks specifically about the situation where the brother has died. The other are injunctions in, just in a general sense. Don't sleep with your sister-in-law. Um, and it makes it, again, the Leviticus 18 passages are in a number of different prohibitions there against forbidden sexual unions. If you look at the whole passage there, I think Kathy may be over there now or have looked it up, but you, you'll clearly see your daughter-in-law. You, you'll see the other listings there about what were forbidden. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't say that the brother is dead. Right. It, I, I think the assumption is that the brother's still alive. So you're being told don't right. have sex with your sister-in-law. And part of the argument for the papal dispensation does tie back to this concept in Deuteronomy 25. And again, Billy, you're right. They seem to be in contradiction, but the Deuteronomy passage has more context and detail. Uh, for example, this is not adultery that the, that the wife of the brother is committing because he is dead. Uh, and again, it, it's intended to preserve, remember, thus preventing his name from being blotted out of Israel. It's intended to provide a lineage moving on down, uh, for example, for property rights. 
But it's this, particularly this second passage, Leviticus 20, 21, that Henry latches onto and says, aha, I know why I haven't been able to have a male son. We are cursed. And this marriage should have never been allowed. And so whether it's because he's already got his eye on somebody else who might be able to give him a male heir, C. Anne Boleyn, or actually Anne's sister Mary, because he was involved with her as well, Mary Boleyn. Um, but he's also looking for a reason to be able to eliminate the marriage to Catherine. And so what happens, this gets referred to as the king's quote unquote great matter. And so one of the things that he does is he actually tasks the clergy, he tasks scholars, study this and basically bring me a report back about you know, what the Bible says about this and all the other stuff. And eventually in 1529, there's a trial that's held, a trial in the sense of reviewing this at a public forum where uh, a bishop or a cardinal, I can't remember which, is sent up from Rome to preside over this. And the question of what should be done here, should this marriage be annulled? Because that's what he's looking for, for to, not a divorce, but just be declared void, is the papal delegate who's there in 1529 actually adjourns that trial, uh, which is called the trial of Blackfriars, and never comes back, just leaves it hanging. So why would the Pope not want to grant Henry what he's asking for? This is another political aspect of this. It would involve <laughs> Philip. Spain. Okay. Go ahead, Mickey. It would involve Philip of Spain when he does not want to disturb that relationship. That's exactly right. We, I didn't show other genealogical charts that are important here, but remember we've talked about Charles V, who is the Holy Roman Emperor that Luther's Reformation is happening under. Oh, by the way, Charles V is Catherine's nephew. <laughs> Charles V's son is going to become Philip II of Spain. Uh, Spain is one of the most adamant defenders of papal authority, particularly during the context we are in now, we're in the 1520s. Luther's Reformation has launched. Calvin's Reformation has launched. There's, um, there's conflict going on in France over uh, being Catholic or Protestant, the things that are happening with the Huguenots. All of that's happening. This is the backdrop for Henry saying, I'd like to annul my marriage, which annulling that marriage will in, would annul the political alliance that had happened between England and Spain. The Pope is not inclined to grant this regardless of what your biblical basis is for it because he's under a lot of political pressure to not do this. So things- well, My understanding too is of an annulment is it's like- It never happened. It, it, right. Or it should not it have happened. It shouldn't have happened. Right. We, we made a mistake. We were, I don't know, too young or drunk or I don't, I don't know. I've always heard that if the annulment is being requested, not a divorce, it's because we made a mistake kind of a thing. But they lived together. I mean, they were married for. Since 1509. Yeah, a long time <laughs> when all of a sudden it's like. 20, 20 years. Give we want an annulment. Well, and, and the other thing that happens during the trial at Blackfriars <clears throat> is that one of the questions, even when the original dispensation is granted, is whether or not Arthur and Catherine, Catherine had, cons had consummated the marriage. She basically to her deathbed swore that they had never consummated the marriage and thus that was part of the justification for the Pope even giving the dispensation was that that, Amer that marriage could essentially be annulled because it was never consummated. And then, that, then she could marry Henry. Um, see what historians have said about whether that was true or not. You can make a case for given their age and given the circumstances, you can make a viable case that that marriage was never consummated. There's other things that suggest otherwise, but she actually testifies during the trial at Blackfriars that her her marriage with Arthur was never consummated. Her marriage with Henry has definitely been consummated. They've had children. She's been pregnant a number of times. So 
where this all gets to is now how is Henry going to get his annulment slash divorce? And so the methodology that, and by the way, just to, just to briefly hit upon this, is Henry is sort of all over the map theologically. We've already talked about how he was a faithful Catholic. He's given the title of defender of the faith by the Pope because of what he wrote. During his reign, he's responsible for the deaths of a number of Protestants. Protestantism is on the rise during his reign. One of the Protestants is who? We talked about him earlier, Tyndall. Who orders Tyndall's death? Henry. Henry. In fact, he orders Henry's death after 1534, which we're going to talk about here in a minute. So on the left-hand side, you can say, is Henry very Protestant? No. No, he's very Catholic. <laughs> on the right-hand side, though, it gives him a political out and a, a theological out to claim that his uh, marriage to Catherine should be made null and void to be, or to at least adopt, some elements of Protestantism. Not only does he put to death Tyndall, he actually ends up putting to death other Thomas More, for yeah, example, friends who, of his, yeah. people that he grew up with, right? Because of their right. So what starts happening around 1529? That's when the trial of Blackfriars happens. Amazing, I didn't put together a slide for that. Is they start working to see how. And there's a Reformation Parliament, a Parliament that's now come to be that's a little bit more inclined towards reform thought, is that there's this concept called premunior in uh, or premunire in English history. The short way of describing that is that this concept, which had come into law back several hundred years before, was that it was illegal for anyone in England to appeal to an authority outside of England for support. So it would be treason, for example, for a, um, a lord in England to appeal to the king of France for support. That would violate the concept. The extension of this that Henry claims that starts to be the case here is that the English clergy were guilty of this concept, not by appealing to a foreign king, but appealing to a foreign power in the form of whom? The Pope. Because the Pope was both a religious figure, but also a political figure. And so one of the early things that happened is Henry makes the claim that members of the English church clergy are violating this concept that you see here by appealing to the Pope or taking their orders from the Pope. They are guilty of treason. And so he issues a decree that the clergy must submit to him. That's in 1531. There's some additional things in 1532 and 1533. But ultimately where this leads is in 1534, where the act of supremacy is declared. And that's that break on our chart. And the act of supremacy, supremacy basically simply said that the English monarch, in this case, it's Henry VIII, is the only supreme head of the, on earth of the Church of England. So the Church of England had been a Catholic church, big C Catholic church. Who was the head of the big C Catholic church? Pope. With the act of supremacy in 1534, the Pope is out and Henry is in as the head of the church. What else changed with that declaration? Well, Henry was excommunicated. Henry was excommunicated by the Pope. Generally speaking, when you say that the Pope is not the head of something, that draws his ire. But in terms of the day in, day out practice in English churches in 1534 after the act versus 1534 before the act, what changed? Uh, they started taking all the Catholic monies and properties and the Catholic priests lost their standing. That's true, eventually, but immediately, basically nothing. Henry does seize the Catholic Church's properties because now they're his, right? He's the supreme head of the church. But the liturgy, the worship, what happened in mass 
early 1534, late 1534, if you didn't know, you didn't know because it was the same. England was still predominantly, very predominantly in its practice, its religious practice was still very Catholic. Only thing that had changed was Henry's in charge versus the Pope. And because of that, what could Henry do for himself? Get, in a, get a divorce, get an annulment. Uh, a bishop could declare that is, you're right, you have a biblical basis for this, you can get an annulment. And in fact, when he marries Anne Boleyn, she is already pregnant with um, Elizabeth, who will be the child that they, uh, that they have. So does he realize then biblically that since she has a, a daughter, not a son, that that's also, I mean, I know what happens, but in the back of his head, doesn't he say, hey, she also has a daughter? not a son, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that, uh, again, with the exception, which is not on this chart of his, uh, of his recognized illegitimate son, Henry Fitzroy, which happens up during this period of time here, <laughs> until 1537, there are sons that are born, but they die. The only surviving offspring is female. In the form of Mary and Elizabeth until we get to Edward. So he has. Didn't he have a child with Anne's sister though? Uh, maybe. <laughs> and I thought that one was supposedly a boy. I believe but he and, and it is. It. If if the child, if Mary's child, who was Mary was Anne's older sister, who he definitely historians agree had an affair with while he was still married to Catherine. If she, if the child that she bore once she was married to somebody else was really his, it was a male child. Yeah, that's why I think he married her off to make it look like it was, yeah. Make it look like, it, yeah, to, to do that, particularly because by that point he was involved with the younger sister, Anne. Uh, if you're familiar with a movie adaptation of this, also Philippa Gregory no novel, The Other Boleyn Girl, takes some historical liberties, but it's in the general flow of things, somewhat accurate. Um, and she definitely has kids, and there's some reason to believe, historians to believe that at least one or multiple ones of those might have been Henry's. So with the act of supremacy, Henry accepts what um, had already been granted by, uh, by uh, Thomas uh, Cromwell as being the legitimate reasons for divorce. So he marries Anne, they have Elizabeth, uh, the whole Anne Boleyn story is a whole other thing. She's she not, she, she gets her head cut off for treason, uh, but may also be argued because she also hasn't produced a living son. And so then he moves on to wife number three, which is Jane Seymour. And Jane actually produces for him a son, Edward, who survives. For a short while. Uh, well, for well, long, for for long enough, while. for long enough. And so you see by the representation here, the marriage to Catherine produces Mary. The marriage to Anne produces Elizabeth. The marriage to Jane Seymour produces Edward. They all eventually do sit the throne, as we looked at earlier when we saw the, the throne bounce around. So this is all the political background. This is where you get the argument that is the English Reformation a theological reformation or a political reformation, at least in its early, its early incarnation. Yeah, there's a biblical case made for part of what happens inside of it. We looked at that, the Leviticus passages, but what's the motivation for what's happening here? He needs an heir. It's mostly political and or personality driven, but politically driven because of the background, the tutors are barely holding on. They're trying to create, you know, they're new. They're trying to create a dynasty, and in Henry in particular has had the personal experience of seeing a male heir die. That's how he came to the throne. And thus, Henry seems utterly obsessed, which is not unique to Henry, by the way, for kings, to producing a male heir. And that produces what happens here. 
And part of what he has to do in the process is break the church away in England to produce that for him. But as he breaks it away under the guise of Protestantism, it is not overly Protestant. But that chart says that Edward the first was, uh, or was it Edward the second was, uh, no, Edward the sixth was 16 when he died. So I thought he was younger. So if Arthur married so young, I wonder why they didn't push for that kid to get married and produce an heir. Um, they, they did to a degree, but it's a little bit different. We're going to talk about that when we get into the next phase of the Reformation here. Because he died of hemophilia, they think, right? right Isn't that what they right. think? I believe that's correct. He was sickly his entire life. I was going to say, I didn't think he survived as long as it, the chart says he did, because he's never portrayed as being robust. Robust. He, he's he's, he's he, kind of, he's baby because he is a son, but he wasn't like Henry was, as in like out hunting and kind of pictured as healthy and you know, boxing and, you know, stuff like that. He's always portrayed as weak, weak he, 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 invalid. He becomes king at nine. He dies at 16. So it's a fairly short period of time that he's there. But, well, even, but even Arthur King, he, he wasn't old enough to really rule. No, he, so there, there, people, there was a regency and that's right. going to become very important here. Regency. The fact that he's under a regency. He's not 18. He's not the age majority yet. But you said Arthur died at 15 before his 16th birthday, right? Right. But also before he was king. He died before his father did. Yeah, I understand that. But he was way young when he was already married to Catherine. So, Correct. wow. Part of, the pro part of the problem of getting Edward married was who do you marry him to because of how the politics had changed because of what was going on. This is now we're in the heart of the religious wars in Europe. Uh, where declaring a bride was definitely declaring either for or against uh, remaining Protestant or becoming Catholic. It was a tricky time. That's when you go to the German princesses. <laughs> well, except a lot of the German princesses were Lutheran now or becoming Lutheran. And so that's when it got complicated there. Eventually, there will be that tie from Germany back into the house of it, you know, that carries that further down the road couple hundred years, but eventually that happens. Notice that Mary is um, um, 21 years the senior of her younger brother, and that's an important thing. And what happens to Mary's status once Catherine is set aside? By the way, Catherine's not executed. She's just sort of put into exile and gotten out of the picture. What happens to Mary? She basically becomes the my poor mother kind of a thing and becomes definitely Catholic. And, and, and she, and then, and her mom was very Catholic very as well Catholic. as her, as her mother was. Right. But the other thing is that Mary is taken out of any appropriate line of succession because she's the offspring. She is made essentially illegitimate, illegitimate by the marriage being invalidated, although she's still recognized as being, she's in this sort of quasi between kind of state. Uh, but she is very Catholic. Elizabeth is much younger. She's much closer in age to Edward. And so Mary is the older sister, definitely in one camp, more her mother's child, definitely. And then the two younger uh, siblings, Elizabeth and Edward, are what they are. So this is about as far as we'll get today. But why this is important, even up until Henry's death, there continues to be more influence of Protestantism in England. It's growing. But Henry is still pretty much, at least for him personally, still very much Catholic all the rest of the way through, in terms of his practice and what he thought the church should be all the way up to his death. So uh, even though they are now Protestant, even though they have broken with Rome, the practice under Henry looks a lot more Catholic. There are... Um, Protestant but folks. I wouldn't that, even call it Protestant, though. Well, one chart that we'll look at later that's a summary chart here sort of defines it as they went from papal Catholicism to just Catholicism. You removed the Pope by changing who the head was through the act of supremacy. 
However, there is this guy named, we're going to talk about him more as we move forward, named Cranmer, who's a very important figure during Henry's reign, and then later, particularly during Edward's reign, and then again during Mary's reign, who is one of the leading proponents for Protestant thought in England. And so he is an interesting creature in English history, because in some ways he's Henry's creature, but in some ways he's not. But a lot of the theology of the English Reformation, the Protestant extent there, comes from Cranmer, his study, his writings, and what happens there. Yes. So now I've totally immersed you in English history for over an hour. Do you see what's different about England's jump into Protestantism versus, for example, the German jump to Protestantism that's initiated under Luther? Luther's yeah. move is mostly a disagreement over theology. At least initially, Henry's move is mostly a disagreement over politics. A little bit of preview, though, is that will change after Henry dies because of Edward assuming the throne. We're, that's where we'll pick up next week is seeing how the English Reformation changes from Henry to Edward, changes again because of Mary, and then changes again because of Elizabeth. And that's where we'll pick up more of the theology. Questions? It either means I did really well or I did really poorly. I'm you just did glad really well. Did. Go ahead. I said you did really yes. well. <clears throat> and I'm glad you video them so I can go back and study them. <laughs> I do, I, I'll put these links also on the on the um, on the class website page. Some of the videos, I'll, I'll link to the specific videos here so you can jump around and find them, particularly the videos that are done by Ryan Reeves that are on YouTube around this topic. He's with a Gordon Cornwell, Cornwell Seminary are really well done. He does a good job of explaining this history in a little bit more detail and summarizing it better. They were just too long for me to play, but I'll put the links there because he'll give you a little bit more depth into that. And if you want to take a look ahead, one of the videos there will be talking about now moving into the Edwardian um, Elizabethan uh, scope of things. All right. <laughs> and Kathy's reminding me now I need to stop the recording. <laughs>